And now I'd like to uh, uh, read some scripture for you today. As uh, you know, we are going through the book of Acts all summer long. And uh, we're, we didn't get very far last week. We only just barely brushed into Acts chapter 2. But now we're going to dig much deeper into Acts chapter 2. Now, if you remember uh, last week or in the very first part uh, of Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and rested upon all the disciples. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues. And there were some people who uh, were uh, disturbed at this. They were perplexed by this. In fact, some people even said, well, they must be drunk. And here's the point where we find out what Peter and the rest of the uh, disciples said at this point. Peter is taking the majority of this first sermon, and here is what he said. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let me explain to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will see dream uh, dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders from heaven and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will turn to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. My fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man accredited by God to bring you miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you, uh, and through our, uh, among, uh, among you through him, as you know yourselves. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about this, I saw the Lord was always before me because he was at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also rests in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here today. But he was a prophet, and he knew God and the promise promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne, seeing the one to come. He spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah so that he was not abandoned to the realm of dead uh, of the dead, nor did he see his body decay. God, raised his, uh, um, uh, God has raised this uh, Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it exalted at the right hand of God and received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit and was poured out to what you see and hear. And uh, for David did not ascend to heaven, yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool at your feet. Therefore, let all of Israel be assured at this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart 
and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children. It's far off for all, um, for all who the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them save yourself from this corrupt generation those who accepted his message were baptized and about three thousand were added to their numbers that day may the lord give glory let us all give glory to god for his holy word and now uh, we're about ready to enter into a time of teaching so i invite you to turn your attention to the screen when Jesus ascended to heaven, he told the disciples to wait in Jerusalem, for they would receive the Holy Spirit and of power and give birth to the church of Jesus Christ that goes on today, continually giving honor, glory, and praise to God. It started in Jerusalem, then spread to all of Israel, and then throughout all the Mediterranean, to finally to the ends of the earth. And even now we are to share the good news of Jesus to every tribe and every nation so that the gospel of Jesus Christ may cover the whole world. This is the story of Acts becoming church. Well, today we uh, continue with this series on the book of Acts. Now, we're going to be marching through the book of Acts because really the book of Acts is the story of the church. You know, the book of Acts is, is uh, actually called the uh, Acts of the Apostles. So this is after Jesus and into the age of where the church really started to operate. We saw last week about how the birth of the church came, and now we see how the church starts to gain some momentum. And uh, that's where we'll be uh, picking up today. Well, as we uh, continually uh, uh, march through the sermon series on uh, becoming church, today we're going to be taking a look at the idea that the Spirit gives courage. I tell you, that was important back then, and honestly, I think it's important now, don't you? Don't you think that it's important that uh, the church of Jesus Christ have the courage to do what's right? Well, hopefully you'll see throughout uh, the common thread throughout this whole sermon series is that the gospel is for the whole world. And it's our job to bring it to the whole world. Well, last week we started out by talking about how the Spirit gave birth to the church. And today we're going to be talking about how the Spirit gives us what we need in order to truly fulfill that mandate of sharing the gospel with the whole world. Well, let's first start out by uh, talking about uh, uh, one, uh, big, one big issue in particular, and that is it's not always easy to speak boldly. I think you'd agree with me on that, wouldn't you? Sometimes, in fact, I think it's very difficult to speak boldly to people. Can I say that I think it's getting worse? I think at the time of Jesus, people could speak boldly and people would disagree and maybe people would try to argue back. In fact, I remember uh, uh, growing up as a kid or even in college, if you had something uh, where, okay, let's say you express an opinion and someone else had a very different opinion. Basically what you would do is you would argue. Now the word argue means you set up your arguments. Here's why I believe I am right. Here's why I believe that your, uh, your statement is somehow wrong. And what you do is you set up an argument. When I was, uh, it was uh, 1986, I was a lobbyist out in Washington, D.C. Don't hold that against me. I see what your looks are out there, okay? And so I spent a lot of time out in Washington, D.C. And uh, we were actually uh, very good friends with one of uh, our congressmen, uh, Al Quee. Does anyone remember Al Quee? By a handful of people, right? And I remember Al Quee said once, he said, things are very different 
in Washington. They operate very differently there than they do here. After he was uh, uh, inaugurated as governor, uh, he said at uh, you know, a, a gathering uh, of us and you know, our family and, and friends, he said, you know, I, when I was on the, the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives, there were many times where things got heated. There were arguments. There were hot tempers. And he says, I remember once when someone stood up and he says, and then I'd like to say the gracious gentleman from the state of whatever it was that he is an, excuse my language, an SOB. And they got really angry. Okay, the gavel fell, the session was over. They met in the center aisle. Uh, they slapped each other on the back and walked out and went to go have a drink or something. You know, the idea here is you could be angry with someone, you could disagree with someone, and still have civility. It feels like that's kind of deteriorating a little bit. Am I the only one who sees that? Wow. It's hard to voice your opinion today. It's hard. I get that, people. I get that. It's hard to speak boldly when you put out something, let's say, on social media. You type something out on Facebook, and if someone disagrees, I expect them to say, uh, you know, I understand what you're saying by this, but I believe that this and this and this and this. Or you bring up Scripture, and they bring up Scripture. You know, counter, for, counter back and forth with one another. It used to be that you would set up an argument to say, here's why I believe that your statement is incorrect. Now it feels like instead of saying, here's why I believe you're wrong, they say, how dare you say that? Whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you mean, how dare I say that? I should be able to say anything as long as it's you know, not treasonous or something like that. Shouldn't we be able to discuss this? I remember once in the very early days of the internet, okay? Early, early days. And we didn't even have internet at my house, but my neighbor did. And he says, you should get into some of these chat rooms. And so there was this chat room uh, about philosophy. And so he logged me, out, logged me on as God man. And as soon as God man appeared in the chat room, uh, people just started to poke at me. And I said, well, here's what I believe, blah, 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 blah. And he replied back, blah, 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 blah. And I replied back, blah, blah, blah. And he replied like, blah, blah, blah. And finally I said, you know, you keep going in that direction and uh, you're going to go the way of Nietzsche, which, you know, I've, he's a philosopher and, and, uh, and an atheist and all that who ended up just being, drove himself crazy and, and took his own life. And he says, hey, you watch what you're saying here. I like Nietzsche. I said, whoa, whoa. You've just been pounding the living daylights out of me for the last half hour, and I mention one thing and you're offended? I think that we all have the right to be offended, right? And frankly, I have the right to be offensive. I try not to be, it's not in my nature, okay? But because you're offended, it doesn't mean that you're right. And it doesn't mean that I'm wrong. I think that is the one reason why it's hard to speak boldly in our current culture. Now, you may think I just ran off on a huge rabbit trail, but it's important that we understand that because of what Peter just got done speaking. You know, Peter just got done sharing this beautiful uh, uh, opening uh, sermon to a bunch of people who are really quite hostile. Now, you have to understand that when Peter spoke, he spoke to a crowd that really was hostile. Could you sense that from the passage I just read? People said, well, they must be drunk. And Peter had to go up there and lighten the mood a little bit and say, hey, well, what do you mean we're drunk? It's only 9 o'clock in the morning for Pete's sakes. These people were ready to distrust him, okay? They were ready to distrust him. In fact, uh, this is what Peter said. Then Peter stood up at the 11 and he says, uh, raise his voice, his fellow Jews, 
Uh, he said, I, I love the fact that he says fellow Jews as to say, hey, we're all in this together. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Now listen carefully. So he's bringing it down to a point of saying, it's okay to speak. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Do you ever feel like when you try to lift your voice that it's basically a hostile crowd you're talking to? Am I the only one who thinks that? It seems like it's getting worse. And I'm not sure I, ha I can really put my finger on it. But it seems that uh, oftentimes when I talk to other kinds of organizations, outside of you lovely people here and, or watching online, um, they often don't want to hear something that is contrary to their own beliefs. Now, please keep in mind, I do believe that there have been conflict for as long as people could learn how to talk, for Pete's sakes. But things are a bit different. Things are now to the point where instead of arguing by, by means of being able to share back and forth and back and forth and try to come up with some sort of uh, a mutual understanding of one another, even if you don't have agreement. And now it turns into hatred. You know, I shared the example earlier about when I was out in Washington, D.C. in 1986. It was a civil environment. Now, believe me, that, those were in the age of Ronald Reagan, and I got to tell you, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, who was the Speaker of the House at the time, were at polar opposites of many issues in that debate. Does anyone remember the President and the Speaker of the House at that time? They were at loggerheads all the time. They would, like, uh, uh, come together, and they would hammer it out. But you know something? They'd also basically hammer it out. They both respected one another in order to bring some sort of way that they could mutually bring governance to uh, the nation. Now, I'm not blaming it all on the government. That's not my, my, my uh, normal way of doing things. But I think that is like a microcosm of what's happening all over. Now, I belong to uh, several closed groups that are just for pastors, okay? Now, you would think that it, it, they're all pastors for Pete's sakes. So you'd think that we kind of have a common thread, but everyone, some groups are just for the conservatives, some for the evangelicals, some for the charismatics, some for the progressives, and from, some to the far left. And every once in a while, I will get into one of these conversations, which that's what we're there for, to get in these conversations. And I remember once I typed in here, and there's something to the effect that, well, uh, here's what the Apostle Paul said about this, and I quoted Scripture. And I sent that out as just my small contribution to the conversation. And within seconds, I got a whole stream of people saying, I don't come into this group in order to get beat over the head with Scripture. Now, w w uh, oh my goodness, you're a pastor, aren't you? And finally, the administrator, the administrator of the Facebook page says, if you keep throwing out this kind of stuff, I'm going to ask you to leave. Why, for Pete's sake? You see, it used to be the, the way we would win people over or to win the argument was to make the most sense. Even if we didn't shake hands and agree, we could at least shake hands as friends. Now it seems like the winners of the arguments are the ones who scream the loudest act the most offended, so to put the blame on you. I gotta tell you, friends, it can be hard to speak boldly in this culture. But that's no excuse, is it? We're not here to serve those people who wanna kick me off of Facebook, amen? We are here to serve the living God. We are here to serve the one who saved me and has saved you. We are the one that, as Peter said time and time again throughout that sermon, he said that he is not dead, but he is alive. He was nailed to a cross, and now he's at the right hand of the Father. 
Yes, I know it's hard. Yes, I get it. But that's still what God has called us to do. That is who God has called us to be. So we know that it's hard to speak to a hostile crowd. And frankly, our uh, whole society is generally hostile to the gospel. That hasn't always been the case, but as a general rule, our culture is hostile to the gospel. But it's also important to understand how Peter addressed the crowd. He used reason, he used scripture, and he used truth. And those are key points that we, too, have to use today. We have to use reason to say there's a reason why I believe what I believe. Uh, I had this interesting talk with uh, one of my confirmation kids. And we, we went around and I said, uh, so tell me, why, is it, why do you believe what you believe? The final part of confirmation is how to uh, be able to express your faith and defend your faith. And this one girl got a little frantic, and she was, like, put on the spot. Well, 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 I don't know. Now, of course, she did know. She was a really smart girl, really smart girl. However, when it comes to defending, I don't think we are always prepared to do that. Now, Peter, oh, Peter. Wasn't that beautiful? The way he anchored everything in the Word of God. He anchored everything in Scripture. Yet, he brought simple, basic reason, but also anchored the whole thing upon truth. This is not just stuff I'm making up, Peter said. This is true, and here is why. I love the fact that the very opening words, after he just got done saying, hey, we're not drunk, he starts out by quoting the, the prophet Joel. Isn't that a great way to start? Because after after all, remember, they just saw something really weird happen. And he says, ah, just like it said in the, in, uh, in the prophet Joel, at the, end of, at the end times, I'll pour out my spirit upon all people, uh, that your men and women will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will see dreams. And he says, don't you understand that this is not uh, unprecedented? This is what God said what will happen. And then he gets into the idea of of truth and reason. And this is what happened. He starts out by saying, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. Now that's unmistakable reason, right? He, it's almost like he's saying, hey, Jesus came here and he did signs and wonders and miraculous things. You know it because you've seen it, haven't you? And they had no other choice but to say, yeah, I guess you're right on that point. This man was handed over to you by God, by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. This was not a mistake. He didn't lose when he died on the cross here, folks. This is part of God's plan, he said. And then he said, and you, with the help of wicked men, uh, they put him to death by nailing him on the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Wow, that's a lot in just a couple of verses, isn't it? Isn't that amazing? Now think of it this way. Peter just was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he went out there and he started to preach this right away. Man, I got to tell you, that is cool stuff, isn't it? Hey, anyone ready to go do that? Anyone ready to go out there and start preaching? Huh? Anybody? Pastor Lyle, you could do it. I know you could do it. <laughs> I also know that that can be a little scary. I do. How many people here had ever heard that uh, the number one fear of Americans is speaking in public, right? Number two is death. So you could twist the statistics around saying people would rather die than speak in public. <laughs> that's, um, that's a laugh line, of course. But 
every once in a while, I'll have someone come up to me after a message, and I'm shaking hands in the back of the church, and someone will come up to me and say, oh, wow, I could never do what you do. Oh, my goodness. I, I, I just can't imagine you up there speaking for like a half hour without any notes or anything. I could, I could never do that. Okay, now, there's several things going at, at, at work there, okay? First of all, it takes a lot of practice to make it seem like you're just making it up, okay? So believe me, I, I, I do all this without notes because I've worked at it all week long. And besides, and besides, if you could have heard my very first sermon, ooh, brother. So I've been doing it a long time, and I also practice all week. So in other words, in some ways, it's a skill that can be learned, okay? I just don't want people to go out there and think, oh, well, you know, pastor, he just does all this. I could never do that. Well, unless you're called to be a pastor and do it every Sunday, that's one thing. I also want to assure you, you can do that. You can go into the world and share your faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, you can. Now, it takes practice. Of course it does. Just like the girl in confirmation who I said, why do you believe, it? Why do you believe what you believe? <gasps> I don't know. Well, it's, that was because she wasn't ready. We, my friends, hear this, should get ready. We should be ready to share our faith in Jesus Christ. Because the world is always asking, why do you believe what you believe? And most of the time, not as a friendly question, not by someone coming up to you and, hey, Clay, I've always been curious. You're a good Christian man. Why do you believe what you believe? Most of the time, it looks more in the face. Hey, Dan, why, do you, why are you a Christian, huh? As if trying to trap you. So let's be prepared. Let's understand our faith, and not only that, practice sharing our faith. In fact, it's my hope that come in uh, the fall that we're going to be doing a lot more of that. Practicing how to share our faith in a way that makes sense. The thing is, if we practice, we'll get better at it. And it'll become second nature. The more that it's second nature, the more we will feel ready to boldly share our faith. You see where I'm going with this? Frankly, most of the time, people are not looking for a theological conversation. You don't need a degree in theology. But what you should know, my friends, is this. Why are you a Christian? If we can just answer three little things about our faith story. Number one. My life before I met Jesus. Describe that. It could be that your life was, I was a druggie, my, my whole life was flushed down the toilet, and I lived in a gutter. Or most people would probably say, you know, my life before Jesus was pretty much the same as it is now. I had a, a good job, a wife, 2.5 kids, whatever, but I was completely empty. Number two, what made you decide to come to Christ. You may say, I went to a Billy Graham crusade, or you could say, I heard uh, a great sermon in church, or maybe I was just at home reading my Bible and I felt the conviction. That's number two. Number three, my life after Christ. When we see people such as come from Minnesota Dalton Teen Challenge, their lives were in the gutter, and now they've given their lives to Christ. Maybe your story is, my life was pretty good with Jesus, or before Jesus. But that emptiness drew me to the cross, and I gave my life to him. And now I still have everything I had, but that doesn't matter as much as Christ in my life. It could be that simple. But you see, it is hard to share our faith. But it's our duty to share our faith. And you will be asked by someone to share your faith. Finally, which is, this is generally the, the toughest thing, is right here, the last point. The power of God leads to salvation. That's a glorious thing. 
The power of the gospel in our lives leads to salvation. When we finally get our courage enough to speak the gospel, say it in a way that makes sense, you'd be surprised at how quickly all of this spreads. You'd be surprised how many people are eager and willing to hear truth explained in a way that they can understand. I just want to share with you, this is how this uh, sermon from Peter ends. He said like this, with many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. I tell you, 3,000 in a day, that's pretty good, don't you think? I tell you, you think about like Billy Graham crusades. Anyone ever been to a great big crusade, something like that? I've been to Billy Graham two or three times. I've been to Promise Keepers, those kinds of things, where it takes up a whole football stadium, 60,000 people, right? And now when Billy Graham says, now I'd like you to come down, and then you, you, uh, you hear, just as I am. No, I'm not going to sing. I love you guys far too much to put you through that. But you hear, just as I am, and thousands of people come and we give glory to God. Am I right? Yeah. That took years of planning before each one of those crusades. You'd expect there to be a lot of people who say yes. Peter had maybe the walk from the upper room to the point where he addressed everyone. That was about all the planning he had. And you know what made that powerful? What made that powerful, my friends, was not Peter's eloquence. I got to tell you, even with all my years of experience and all of my time in practice and writing and trying to get this down right, if I did not have the power of the Holy Spirit who is in me, I would have no authority. I would have no power. Not a single person who has ever proclaimed the gospel where people have responded could say, I came to the gospel outside of the power of the Holy Spirit. And the power of the Holy Spirit is nothing less than the very person of God. It was God at work from the very beginning. It was God at work who put this glorious plan into effect. It was God at work in the form of Jesus Christ who came to earth to teach, to do miracles, to show the love of God, and finally to die in our behalf. And it is nothing less than the very person of God who is in us, giving us the power giving us the wisdom. I also got to tell you, in many cases, giving us the words that we need. And my God, he's faithful. You know that? Pastor Lyle's probably the only one in this room who can understand this, but can you imagine preaching every single week. I don't know how long you were a pastor, Pastor Lyle, but I'm working on 27 years right now. I don't have enough good things to say. You know that? There's no way I should be able to do anything. And I got to tell you, I know it's not about me. I can remember several instances, but let me just share with you one. I was uh, a pastor fresh out of seminary. And I was pastoring three little churches. And I wrote up a message that I thought was pretty good. It was pretty decent. And I was driving from my first church to my, or for where I lived to my first church. And I was praying along the way. Good thing it was about 15 miles. And I said, well, Lord, I just pray that this sermon is worthy of you, and I just pray that your spirit would, would take my feeble human efforts and turn them into something better. And God said, are you sure? Do you mean that? And I said, absolutely, Lord. And then he said, you're not going to preach that message. 
I'll give you one. So all the while, I kind of fought with God <laughs> on the rest of the trip. Are you sure, God? I mean, I trust you. I love you. I do all, all, all this stuff. Yes, Lord. And then the time came where I had to go in the church, and there was my message in the folder. And I had to make the choice. Do I bring it in just in case God doesn't give me the word? Or do I put my whole trust in him? Oh, brother. I brought my Bible and I left my notes. I went in, and you're going to think I'm exaggerating. I, honestly, I think I'm exaggerating, and I was there for Pete's sakes, right? So I started out the message. Uh, so I started out the service. Hey, everybody, welcome aboard, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm starting to do all these other things, and all the while I'm thinking, oh, God, give me the message. I don't know what I'm going to do. And finally, the, came, the time came where I opened up my Bible, and I read, just like I did today, right? So I read through uh, the Scripture, and then it was as if. God not only whispered in my ear, but almost played a movie in fast-paced, double speed. It's like, well, what else could this mean? And I got up and I preached that with more power and authority than I could ever have done before. And by the time I was done, I said, someone ought to write that down. That was pretty good, because it wasn't for me. I say that only because I know that it's frightening to go up and share your faith with an unbelieving world. I know that it's hard to go off and to truly be the church by presenting the gospel to a world who needs it. I also know very well, my friends, I get it. It's hard. But it's never been about you. Amen? It's never been about me. It's about us surrendering to say, Lord, whatever you want. If you've called me, I will go. But if I go, Lord, it's up to you to equip me, to make me ready, to give me that power to give me the authority, to give me the wisdom, and in some cases, Lord, give me the words that I need to bring an unbelieving world to the foot of the cross. That's what happened when Peter stood up and spoke. It wasn't an anomaly. It wasn't a one-time thing. It was an example by which all who believe share the good news so more will believe. Now, in just a few minutes, we're all going to pray together. And I hope each one of us is ready to receive what God has to offer. For those of you who've been in this church for a long time, you'll, you have heard me say this many, many times. But I'm going to repeat it today as an invitation. I invite you, if you're willing and if you feel comfortable, to pray with your palms open. Now, this is nothing mystical or magical or weird. It is a reminder to us that we're not here to pray just to throw things up to God, but we are here to receive what God is trying to offer you today. Let's pray together. Most gracious and holy Lord Jesus, oh, we thank you. We praise you, Lord. And Lord, I know that you have called us. You have called each one of us, oh Lord, into the ministry of sharing your good news with a world who needs it so badly. Lord, I'm ill-equipped. We're all ill-equipped. We can't do this. We can't do this on our own. And I'm so glad that you've never asked us to do it alone. Pour out your spirit in such a real and palatable way that we would have no choice but to say, yes, Lord. If I put my trust in you, I have to put my trust in you all the way, even to use the power and the authority, the wisdom, 
the love, the grace, and even the words to approach an unbelieving world so that we may truly share the gospel with every tribe and every nation, every house and every neighborhood. But let it start with me. Let it start right now. Give us all what we need. For we do thank you. We do praise you. We lift up your name above all names and we give you all the honor, glory, and praise in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. Amen.